Today I'm talking about health promotion, and it's about initiatives that um, we have begun at the University of Toronto. Um, and it's supposed to try to give a flavor of uh, what could be thought of as some global type of initiatives. Uh, but the reality is, is that we have a lot to learn from our colleagues here in Southeast Asia because everything that occurred today and yesterday shows that there's all sorts of innovations happening uh, everywhere. Um, Canada uh, is seen by many as a wonderful destination to live, to travel. Uh, it has many wonderful aspects and attributes. Um, uh, we enjoy a high standard of living. Um, it's one of the G8 countries, lots of freedom. And one of the things that Canadians are most proud of is the single-payer uh, universal health coverage system that was introduced uh, over 25 years ago uh, that has enabled Can Canadians to, we say, thumb their nose at the Americans south of the border because we had, uh, in fact, attained a level of equity that uh, Americans are still trying to pursue. But, in fact, uh, unsurprisingly, Canada is facing the same challenges that uh, countries are facing around the world in terms of aging populations and an obesity epidemic, inexorably rising health care costs. And we have some particular disparities that we are not proud of. Uh, this is just one example. Um, looking at uh, the child poverty rates in Canada, comparing uh, those of most Canadians with the indigenous children um, in Canada, and many have pointed that out as Canada's shame. And in fact, the Canadian health system is not performing as well as, uh, as it had in the past. Uh, the latest report from the Commonwealth Fund which looks at and compares the health system performance of, of uh, members of the G20 nations, uh, shows that Canada ranks in terms of its summary score, just above the United States in terms of uh, all these different indicators that you can see over here. There's the Canadian flag right there. Now our school uh, is very proud to be at the center of some of the health system uh, innovation discoveries uh, and teaching. Uh, it's a school that's been around for a long time actually. Uh, it was one of the original Rockefeller Foundation schools of hygiene that was created by um, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation along with Harvard and Johns Hopkins in 1927. Uh, but then the school actually disappeared in 1975 and it took the SARS crisis, uh, which you know very well here in, uh, in Asia of 2003 to uh, awaken Canada's interest in uh, system, systemic public health, federal public health, and that's when our school was reestablished uh, and now represents the biggest school of public health uh, in Canada. Uh, it's organized in some of the same units as you might expect in any school of public health, uh, along uh, with a faculty uh, based in the uh, disciplinary units that are seen in any school of public health. This is kind of an interesting innovation by itself. Uh, we created this division uh, especially to pursue scholarship that integrates public health with primary care. Um, and that's where a lot of our clinical scholars um, live. But in fact, as um, most of you know, the best public health research uh, will be transdisciplinary and also involve multiple sectors. Uh, and these are some of the interdisciplinary units, uh, centers and institutes that have been created in the school, uh, some of which I'll be talking about, as well as uh, examples of some of the partners we have around uh, the greater Toronto area, some of them within the university, like the Department of Sociology, but others representing NGOs and governments and all sorts of different uh, uh, powerful groups that have a stake in public health and have a role to play. So now I'm just going to discuss six, six types and examples of health promotion innovations um, along the lines of behaviors and skills, approaches, measuring impact, 
marginalized populations, outcome concepts, and evidence. Uh, you have uh, some wonderful uh, uh, NGOs and academics who are looking at tobacco control. Uh, ours is the Ontario Tobacco Research Unit, uh, and some of the issues that they're tackling now are is the growing proliferation of users of e-cigarettes, um, uh, the uh, importance of looking at the toxicity of all the different flavors that are introduced uh, into tobacco, uh, looking at variations of how to uh, ban smoking in outdoor places where the off-gassing of, of tobacco can still pose a passive smoking hazard uh, to people nearby, um, looking at different uh, smoking cessation strategies, and in particular looking at tobacco reduction in Aboriginal communities, which uh, remain disproportionately affected by the tobacco epidemic. Uh, we also have uh, global health scholars who are looking at this uh, in terms of uh, global tobacco control. Prabhat Shah is the uh, director of an effort to look at this worldwide and using uh, worldwide statistics to look at the effects of smoking, quitting, and taxing tobacco. And here's some interesting examples of analyses which show clearly how the uh, creation of taxation uh, policies uh, uh, have this very nice uh, inverse correlation with uh, tobacco consumption in these uh, exemplar countries of South Africa and France. Uh, these are all approaches that the health economists have been looking at um, uh, in terms of how we might continue making progress on the tobacco epidemic uh, in the 21st century, uh, with a new Lancet Commission being formed with uh, partners here in, in uh, Bangkok and elsewhere uh, to come up with a new set of recommendations for the 21st century. Here's uh, another uh, innovation in terms of behaviors. Um, uh, and Anya Banerjee has created uh, some partnerships with uh, leaders in moms and mosques to create physical activity programs specifically designed uh, towards um, Muslim women, uh, which is a direct response to the uh, epidemic of obesity being seen in South Asian immigrants in, the, uh, in Canada. Uh, this has turned out to be a very successful program with uh, activity guideline um, uh, uh, improvements from 57 to 89 percent in terms of the participants meeting those guidelines uh, and con continuing them uh, after six months uh, of the program. Uh, Shafi Boyan is here in the audience, one of our faculty, uh, has another uh, behavioral innovation, uh, his work on championing the Maternal and Child Health Handbook created in 2002. Uh, the investments he's made in, in uh, propagating uh, this instrument in Bangladesh and in many other countries by organizing international conferences on its use, its implementation, and its effectiveness. In terms of innovations and approaches, um, I think the biggest one that we've seen in our school has been the investment of interest in social innovation and social entrepreneurship. Uh, this is being led by Alex Haddad, who's the new director of our Institute for Global Health, Equity, and Innovation. And here's where uh, we have to remind ourselves is what is social innovation? Uh, defined by this group at the Stanford Graduate School of Business as a novel solution to a social problem that is more effective, efficient, sustainable, and just than current solutions. So it's not an invention per se, but it's a level of creativity and a way of doing it in society uh, that will get things scaled up and adopted. So as an, in, as an example of what they're doing is that they're attacking this problem of child hunger, which shockingly remains a problem even in the greater Toronto area, uh, by creating social ventures with businesses uh, and NGOs that are working on this and uh, using this event called the Hacking Food Workshop, where young people in particular who can bring their technical and internet-based skills in matching employers, uh, food distribution networks, restaurants, suppliers, grocers, uh, to match with the NGOs and community groups that can 
provide the distribution networks uh, to actually make progress on what has seemed to be an intractable problem in Toronto. Now, the success of this um, way of thinking has led to a, a new center in the, you know, in the school, the Healthier Cities and Communities Hub, led by Patricia Campo and Blake Poland. Uh, they just launched a seed funding initiative that requires uh, the community groups to collaborate with uh, groups of our investigators. Um, uh, this is an initiative co-sponsored by Toronto Public Health an NGO, the Wells Institute, uh, and that we're looking forward to create through individual entrepreneurship efforts, home and crop of social innovation ventures. There's another uh, innovation and approach, um, because all of you, I hope, are movie fans, I certainly am, but the recognition that movies represent an incredibly useful and impactful way of changing people's attitudes and perhaps behaviors. Uh, Uttam Bajwa, who's a special projects fellow for, for the Dean's Office, has created this new initiative with one of the largest international film festivals in the world, which occurs in Toronto. And our students will be screening over 200 films to select those of particular global health value in terms of their content and impact for school-wide screenings and discussions and it's part of the aim of creating a whole new initiative on how to promote health through film. In terms of uh, innovations, in terms of measuring impact, we have a new center, the Canadian Center for Health Economics, directed by Audrey Laporte, which is using health economics to increase the impact of a lot of the discoveries that are made by the public health scientists and make them directly more useful for policymakers by calculating the economic costs of child mortality, health behaviors, how home care is structured. Uh, and these are the kinds of, um, of uh, initiatives that have attracted fellows from all over Canada. Uh, and uh, this center is very keen on developing collaborations here in Asia uh, to use this kind of approach to affect policy. This is kind of a related center. It's called the Center for Evidence and Health and All Policies. The bottom line is that it addresses this political mandate of governments almost everywhere. That, yeah, we want you to have more impact, but we're not going to spend any more money on it. So how do you actually work in that framework? Well, there's actually some tools that can be used. We call it evidence-based budgeting as a way of enhancing public services and improving public engagement by specifically analyzing and comparing different types of evidence to target those uh, interventions that have the highest return on investment um, and increase benefits without affecting budget. It's created a center of its own that uh, has become uh, a useful uh, collaborator with some of the other centers around uh, North America that are operating in this kind of uh, funding constraint environment. Uh, and this may, of course, also have utility as a concept for our collaborators here in Asia. Next is innovations in marginalized populations. Um, we uh, have uh, been greatly gratified by the um, uh, largesse of one of our university donors, Michael Dan who contributed $10 million to create the first endowed institute for, of indigenous health that we're aware of in the world. Um, Michael Dan is a very unique uh, donor. He uh, is a graduate of the medical school, a neuro neurosurgeon who inherited uh, his family's company. Uh, one of their assets was developing hydroelectric power plants, um, which have to, which mostly take place as partnerships with indigenous communities up north in northern Canada. And when he got to see firsthand just how desperate the conditions were in these indigenous communities, he vowed to make a difference, and this is what we had. Uh, this is an institute that has already started to, uh, uh, its first set of um, 
uh, research uh, projects on cancer in the environment in the far north, where there's apparently several clusters of cancer in First Nations environments uh, with suspected relationships to particular environmental exposures and new projects to reduce perinatal mortality and morbidity. So here's another example of working with marginalized populations. Uh, Carol Stroik, one of our first professors, works with one of the most difficult populations to work with, those people living with HIV AIDS who still continue to abuse uh, drugs or other substances. They turn out to be uh, some of the most uh, shunned by the healthcare community as well as uh, social agencies because they're, they're so difficult uh, to address. Uh, many times their personalities are labeled as challenging, manipulative, drug-seeking, and demanding, yet we still owe it as humanitarians to figure out how we can best accommodate their needs uh, and try to keep them in a healthy state and in a hospital. Uh, and she's using a whole series of transdisciplinary approaches to find the best tools for measuring patient experience, outcomes, and best practices. Then there's innovations and outcome concepts, um, and this may be in some way uh, the most innovative of all. Um, this is a reminder of how WHO has defined what it means to be healthy uh, since its uh, early convention in 1948. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. By that definition, uh, it'd be hard to identify anybody in this room who's completely healthy. I wear contact lenses, so I'm definitely not healthy. Um, but actually, if uh, we were to take a poll and who felt healthy in this room, enough to go to work and to have a productive life, I think most of your hands would go up. And that's part of um, what uh, Alex Haddad and his colleagues have created, you know, which is a new definition of health, um, the capacity to adapt and self-manage in the face of physical, mental, and social changes. And they've used this metric to create a whole new set of uh, self-surveys and shed light on the insight that, in fact, you can have several chronic disease conditions but feel quite healthy at the same time. Uh, this is a survey done in Canadians, uh, and this is uh, what has been done globally. And I think the, the basic lesson here is that uh, as we think of how the healthcare environment continues to consider its goals, treating disease as they measure it, uh, instead of necessarily indices of well-being, productivity, um, I think we have an opportunity to refine what we define as health outcomes, uh, especially in aging societies where we're using so much of our resources uh, to further lifespans rather than improve uh, um, quality of life. The final uh, innovation relates to evidence, um, and uh, I'd like to address this whole issue of big data. Uh, big data is often touted as the next big thing. Uh, look at all the literature on Silicon Valley companies, uh, huge amounts of money being poured into creating gigantic databases of people, their blood, their DNA, their uh, laboratory values, their medical information. But in fact, if you look at where big data for health is actually going, it's really all about genomics. It's about health care. It's not really about prevention or health promotion or public health. And a lot of it, unfortunately, is driven by the uh, the motivation to see profits and develop products that will, in fact, can be sold in the market. And if you look at what big data actually means in public health, that is, the access to really large databases of people and health and disease, most of it, the conversation has been about infectious disease and modeling infectious disease. And the question that we raise is, can we embrace big data pursue true population health values. And here's where, if you think of the four axes that are often described as the axes in which to look at big data, big data is defined by the volume of data, 
the variety of data, the velocity and speed which can be analyzed now with great informatics, software, hardware, and the veracity of the data, each one of these has opportunities to actually expand our notion of what the big data means in terms of population health and the upstream drivers of what truly makes people healthy and then pursue policy relevant research using this kind of data. Our source in Ontario is the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, which has taken advantage of the fact that the Ontario Health Study and our universal health coverage system has generated data on almost 20 million Ontarians with everything you do with the health system in that database. And 10 years ago, we made that database available through a whole series of ethical and informed consent procedures We made it available for research. We now can combine it with very large cohort studies like the Ontario Health Study, over 200,000 Ontarians, giving blood, answering questionnaires, providing the GIS location, and now we can do research like this, looking at high-cost healthcare users in Ontario and describing a lot of their upstream characteristics and socioeconomic characteristics. Now we also have access for the first time to the largest database on indigenous uh, peoples in the world, over 200,000 First Nations peoples uh, on whom we have data that we can use for these kinds of purposes. We can use GIS to geolocate and link air pollution data. Here's an example of air pollution data from all over the GTA that's been generated by our environmental scientist, Greg Evans. Uh, that is now linked to Toronto residents for the past 20 years. And now we're working on a whole set of other databases that can be included, uh, either through new surveys or access to other GIS linked databases. All that will allow us to have a much fuller picture of the social and cultural determinants of disease and health. And uh, there are investigators like Pravat who are looking at how to make these kinds of databases uh, available uh, throughout the world. Uh, here's you know, arguably the largest epi study in the world, the one million death study in India. He's now uh, expanding this model uh, to other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and in Asia. And the last innovation, I guess, is partnerships. Uh, this is a picture just taken day before yesterday, I guess, uh, or yesterday, uh, as part of a MOU signing with uh, the ASEAN Institute. Uh, we look forward to creating other partnerships with the great institutions here in Bangkok. Uh, we have another faculty leader who's here, uh, Peter Coit, uh, who's a uh, health economics and health technology assessment expert, uh, who's part of our team along with shopping. Uh, the Canadian Embassy has been a wonderful host for us uh, and we look forward to advancing these kinds of collaborations and ideas and learning from everybody else in this room uh, to make progress on this concept. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Wu. And if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand and introduce yourself and the institution where you're from. And please make it brief. Any questions, comments, suggestions related to the presentation? I didn't put them to sleep. looks. <laughs> <laughs> Silence. Okay, have them in the back. <laughs> Hello, my name is Dr. Farhan Kabir. I'm an intern at AHD. So, my question is that uh, since you have stated um, a lot of work, big data is one of them on marginalized and indigenous people mainly. So could you give a brief offline of, like, is it focused on Canada only, or is it focused on Asia, or 
a brief outline about in an international perspective. Sure. Actually, let me just go to that for a second. So, um, one thing I put up on the slide that I didn't talk about was um, this person here, uh, Peter Bryce. Um, and uh, his story is emblematic of Canada's uh, problem, uh, which is that, in fact, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which just concluded its work last year, um, reviewed a lot of the history of of how Canada has treated its indigenous populations. And, and the conclusion was, uh, in fact, um, there's evidence of genocide. Uh, Peter Bryce was a physician in the Indian Health Service who was hired to uh, try to manage uh, the health of the residential schools, which are the schools where all of the children of uh, indigenous tribes were forcibly taken from families and put into the schools to try to be taught uh, Canadian values uh, and education, etc. And uh, after studying this for several years, he concluded that in fact, um, the mortality rate was upwards of 40% over five years. And in fact, uh, the Canadian government knew about it and did nothing about it. Uh, voluntarily chose to do nothing about it, which added to the evidence of this being uh, genocide. Um, so Canada has a very special uh, moral imperative uh, to improve the health of its indigenous populations. The disparity statistics are shocking. Um, but in fact, uh, the intention is to make this institute uh, a globally um, connected institute uh, with indigenous health movements around the world. Uh, there are some countries that seem to have done better than others. Um, I don't know if Adrian's here, but New Zealand in particular uh, has seemed to do quite well. Um, and uh, uh, I think uh, there are lessons to be learned uh, by so many of our um, scholars uh, about uh, indigenous peoples uh, wherever we are. Um, it's actually great to see one of our scholars, I, Renee, I didn't, didn't have to wait again. See one of our young students here, uh, uh, also part of the, uh, the Toronto contingent. Um, and she's worked on indigenous health, and uh, um, we look forward to working with everybody else on this. Hope that answers your question. Thank you very much for, for the question, and thank you so much, for, Professor Fu, for the presentation.